So, um, first of all, I should probably say apologies for missing last week's meeting. Mm -hmm. I have a couple of things going on <laughs> my workplace that I kind of have to attend to. Um, so my 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 availability sometimes will be drawn back a bit. Uh, I anticipate it's likely going to happen a lot more in March um, than February. Otherwise, so we're kicking off today with, with factors. And I decided to do a quick step back um, to the entire Rango section itself, right? Because I, I kind of felt like there were two things that jumped out at me. So number one um, is this entire chapter or this entire part itself. Uh, I mean, looking at this diagram, it's pretty easy to see. We started off with visualization. I guess the idea of the book is visualization is a lot more interesting. So let's kick off there. But where we are now is these three parts. So import, tidy, transform. And we are a lot more in the transforming part. And the idea is to learn about maybe two major things. One is forms of data that you are likely going to deal with. Um, so we've gone through tools, for example, for dealing with multiple interrelated data sets. We've gone through manipulating strings. We are going to do, we're going to talk about category data today, especially factors. Uh, then next week, we'll talk about data and types, right? So the, the entire idea of this part is just to give us, how do you manipulate your, your data that you have? And the reason why I wanted to call that out is at some point when you're going through the chapters in these parts, you, you realize that there are certain things that are subjective, right? So it depends on either what your objective is, or what you want to represent, or, you know, how you feel. So there, there are certain parts here that are not necessarily coded or standardized, but it's just heavily dependent on what you think you want to do, right? And we would see that play out itself in chapter 12, right? So there's a number of things that the chapter tries to teach that I would have done differently, right? Because, you know, depending on data sets I'm working, depending on data sets I'm working with, or, or, or what my problem statement is at that point in time, I'll probably have done it differently. But it's a very, very interesting chapter, especially for folks that work with a lot more uh, categorical data. My, my work stream right now heavily relies on categorical data. So this is very, very new for me, uh, working with categorical data itself. So it's a very interesting chapter for me to go through to see how you can manipulate information on that categorical data, right? So that's where I started to start from. The other thing I also wanted to talk about is, so, so the, way, the way I usually go through my entire readings is, I walk through the book itself. Um, uh, then sometime I flip through, I flip to, let me do a new chair here. I flip to my art studio, right? Then, then I go back to um, the solution set itself. Um, which would be, let's give me a minute, let me see how I can, which would be here, right? Um, and, and that entire journey is kind of how I'll take you guys through. So forgive me if everything seems quite um, mumbled up, but I will try my best as much as possible to make it organized. I would largely focus a lot more on the book, right? Um, uh, because I mean, I have a lot more highlights on my thought process here. Then when we get to the exercises, I'll go to the solution page. Then if there's anything I want to call out directly, then I'll go to my art studio itself. Um, any, any other thing that I probably have written out, then I'll go to my art studio itself. But my, the entire journey is going to be a bit more about the book itself. So let me, let me, let me take this to the chapter itself. Just give me a minute. Um, mm -hmm. Right, so let's go to chapter 12. All right. Um, all right, so let's go on. So the first part is we're trying to manipulate factors with four cards, right? Um, and if we kick off here, so number one, factors are used to work with categorical data. Categorical data. Right, and the way the category data is kind of defined here is there are variables, right? I have a fixed and known set of possible values. So in other words, they are, they are finite, right? Um, and they have a clear idea, and this is a beginning and an end in the particular variable itself. 
Uh, they are also very useful when you want to display character vectors in a non-alphabetical order, right? So they can also be displayed uh, haphazardly, right? Um, and, and that's one of the big things we are going to talk about in this chapter. How do you organize a particular display itself, right? Um, so historically, factors were much easier to work with. And as a result, many of the functions in base R automatically convert characters to factors. Yeah, I, I think I see this sometimes when you work through certain data sets, you realize that automatically those data sets convert uh, your character variables into factors, right? But the problem here though is uh, sometimes factors crop up in places where they are not usually helpful, right? So sometimes you actually just want to work with the character variable itself, but you know, the data set has converted itself to a factor, right? Um, and I guess this is where tidyverse comes in. So let me pause here. One of the, one of the other things I think I've realized in this book is, is obviously heavily focused on the tidyverse package itself and trying to get you to see that your entire, your entire data work process can be done within, within this package, right? Uh, from the visualization all the way to where we are right now, right? Uh, and the beauty here is uh, tidyverse can help you focus on situations where factors are generally useful, right? And they left some, you know, if you want to do some deep dive into factors itself, you can go through this. This link here is wrong. So I have the right link here. Um, let me post this on the channel in case, in case anybody wants to do a deep dive into factors itself. Um, Roger Peng is a very interesting, very interesting writer. Um, so let's, let's do some, some, some bits of prerequisites, right? So the first part is you have to load forecast package. Um, and here in this book, I think at the point where this book was written, forecast was of the core universe. So you have to load it separately. But you know, doing a deep dive on tidy verse itself, like your expression. Big problem you can see right? this is mu spelled. And one of the things they try to call us call out here is two problems you can identify when you are creating factor. One, at least this particular factor itself. Number one, there are only 12 possible months, right? And then nothing saves you from making a typo. Something very similar here, right? So for someone that is a fast typer like me, it's very possible that I could just make this kind of error to so JM. For example, the second thing you'd also realize is if I decide to sort this variable, right, anyone, either x1 that was done correctly or x2 that was done incorrectly, we realize that it doesn't properly sort out, right? So we all know that January comes first uh, and March should probably be second, then April, third, and December, four, right? But if you create a factor this way, there's no way you are going to, or there's no way you are going to, or your code is going to realize that certain things are meant to be done. In a particular order. Now you can fix this entire thing with factors, right? But if you want to create a factor, you have to create what they call list of valid level, right? Um, so for this particular variable itself, valid levels will be uh, ranking January all the way to December in the right order, right? Then if you want to create a factor, um, you can just easily pass it through this variable using the factor package, uh, impute x1, then levels become these month levels, this that you just created. Right? Um, then when you run it, you will see that it displays as is, uh, and the levels, the way you have created it, obviously uh, ranks itself, right? So now if you decide to sort, it's automatically going to sort out itself you know, for you, right? Um, uh, the other interesting thing is, so for this kind of variable that we created that has an obvious wrong misspelling, if you do this kind of creation for it, where you run it through this factor, it's going to create an NA for you, 
which is very useful, especially if you have large data sets. So if you have very large variable itself, it's very easy for you to know that at least a portion of your variable has been misspelled or misaligned in a way, all right? So obviously, if you also sort this, it's now goes over to sort it for you uh, because now you have multi levels, right? Then if you want to go an extra step, for example, you want to identify a mistake without having to wait for, you know, without catching it yourself, you could also use this. So you could pass this through pass factor, use X to then levels become the same month levels you had created, then to show you a warning, right? The way this is going to display is, let me use my else to do this. Uh, so it's going to display something like this, right? Um, where it just shows you that there's a warning here, uh, you know, there's a particular colon that was set in a wrong spelling. Right. Um, let me go back to my book. Um, now, the other piece now is if you omit the levels, right? So if you just create factor the way it is without putting these month levels, what happens is um, um, you have, it's literally going to display it pretty similar to what you have here, right? So April, December, January, March. Right, uh, and sometimes you sometimes you prefer that the other match the other of the first appearance in the data. So similar to how you have created, it wasn't actually a mistake the way you created it. And if you want to leave it the way it is without making it sort itself, you just use unique as part of your levels. Um, uh, uh, then um, then it, it literally displays the same way as you have your data set. I can see a comment in the chat. Oh no, can you guys hear me now or have I frozen up? It it sounds it sounds good. It was just for um a couple of minutes ago, it was freezing up pretty bad, but it's it's been clear for the last few minutes. Fantastic. So I, I don't need to go back, I suppose. That's great. All right. So so where, where I ended here is if you created a variable and you want it to literally create in the same way or you want your factor to appear in the same way that you had created the variable. So the assumption here is you had no mistakes, just use unique, right? So then pass you also to unique, right? And it literally shows the way it is. Um, um, or you can decide to use this symbol that I think at the end it was true, um, uh, uh, to sort in that particular way. So again, you can pass it through this entire function itself, right? Um, then I guess an extra step is if you want to access the levels directly, um, uh, you could just use levels and call the function itself um, and, and, you, and you get your data set, right? Um, we would see an occasion here as, as when we get, you know, all the way down in the book, we'll see an occasion here for when you might need the levels directly, right? Uh, so I'll probably take a pause there to see if there's any questions or anything I could probably just run through. Because the next bit is now deep diving into a data set itself to see, you know, how this entire forecast, forecast, forecast package plays out itself. All right, so I don't stop here to see if there are any questions. Or you could give me a thumbs up if you want to continue. It looks like Adeyemi has a question in the chat. Daniel. All right. I can't see a question from my end though. Adi, I mean, do you have a question? Uh, that might have been just. Sorry, sorry. I mistakenly sent it. I passed not missing. It was a mistake, but I've sent it now to my <laughs> entire group. That was the same as Sultan. Exactly, right? So, as factor, obviously, we did exactly the same work here. Right, um, as 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 sorting itself. So if you don't want to use the sort itself, you could probably use as factor. Right. So so let let's deep dive into the data set itself. Um, so the first bit is they gave us a data set that I think is quite interesting. One of the reasons why it's interesting is a lot more of the variables are categorical variables, um, and uh, and I guess for 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 a package like this, obviously, it's very useful. Um, for us to deep dive and try out different colons themselves, um, uh, for us to kind of understand the idea of the forecast uh, package itself, right? And uh, you can learn more about this package if you use this, right? Um, 
Um, so we've, we've spoken about a table before uh, uh, when we wanted to convert a data frame. I think at the very beginning of when we started the Franco class itself, spoken about the table. I think one of the problems with the table is unlike this levels where you can see or this entire code structure where you can see the levels immediately, a table doesn't necessarily show you the levels, right? Um, so you can't necessarily see, you know, what's going on itself in a data set. Um, um, however, if you want to call that out explicitly, you could just use the count function, right? So in this case, for example, they use the count race, right? So this itself, they wanted to see what levels look like here. Uh, and the beauty here is it gives you two colons, right? So it gives you the race itself and it gives you the number because you're using a count here, right? Or you could use this with a bar chart, right? Um, so if you want to visualize it, you could just run GSS cart itself um, as your data. Uh, then you just look for only the X variable as race uh, and it shows you the count itself and it shows like something like this. Right, but that, that's aside from, from what we're currently doing. It's just for if you want to see uh, particular levels uh, specifically in the data set. Um, the, the other thing here though, that I think is quite, it's quite important is, so, so if you are trying to visualize or, or trying to, if you piece apart a particular variable, right? And they have uh, missing, missing variables or missing entries, so ggplot is going to drop them. So ggplot will drop levels that do not have values, right? So in this kind of case, for example, imagine if there was a particular level, so order black and white or something else that did not have any value, ggplot would have dropped it. If you want to see that explicitly, um, you just use scale x discrete, drop is equal to false, right? Then it calls that out explicitly for you. So you can see that there are some that are not applicable, right? Now, obviously we're not showing up here, but since you're now, you're now calling it up directly, you can out say it. This, this kind of, using this code structure itself rather than the short, the short version, definitely helps when you have, when a, a missing value, for example, is also a, is an important part of the data set that you're trying to run or an analysis that you're trying to do. Um, so I guess why I actually feel what is approach itself um, over the, the, the short term approach, even, even if there's nothing that, that's missing itself in a data set. Right. Um, uh, all right. So the, 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 the main part of the chapter itself talks about these two things, right? So the two most common operations that we're going to do on a factor variable, right? And there are two of them. The one is we could decide to change the order of the levels, or we could decide to change the value of the levels themselves, right? And we'll describe um, this in the following sections. However, uh, there are some exercises that were given to us. So now these exercises are not, they are not very to factors itself, but they are a lot more to understand like the data set itself. Um, uh, I think, I, I guess that's why, that's why they're useful. So I'll flip over here um, to talk through those exercises themselves, right? So the first question was, if you look at the data set itself, so like the, uh, let me see how I can pull it up. So if you look at the GSS card data set itself, um, let me go back here uh, to the main data set itself. So this, this variable, right? They just want us to understand a bit more distribution in this variable uh, itself. That's the first question, right? So explore distribution of a income variable. So it's called reported income. Then the questions under that is, what makes the bar charts, if we decide to explore this, what makes the bar charts difficult to understand and how can we improve the plot, right? So this, that's why I said it has nothing to do with the factors chapter, but just an interesting deep dive for us to understand the GSS, you know, data set itself a bit more. So if you run this through ggplot, the first thing you probably see is now this x-axis. It's very, very, very terrible, right? So, I mean, you can't make sense of anything that's going on here, this x-axis, right? And that's where the problem is coming from, right? So like, like what they said here, the problem is the default chart setting is the labels are overlapping and they're enforced to read, right? 
So this author decided to change uh, this x-axis using an extra claim function on that digit plot, right? So the way we did this is, now we have assigned this entire plot itself to this variable, uh, rincon plot. So we just added an extra function theme, axis or text dot x. So for the x um, uh, axis itself, uh, and in the text, then we can angle it at 90. The best thing here is obviously if you decide to angle it at 90, you can imagine that it's probably getting straight lined. Uh, so it might be difficult to read it because you might have to tilt itself. So the best thing could be maybe the 45. So this basically makes it a bit more interesting to read, right? Um, or an extra way you could probably do it is to use what you call a chord flip, right? So you could just attach this entire variable itself to a chord flip where this issue just switches this entire thing. So this makes it a lot more easier to read, right? Um, uh, so by, by putting it here on the, uh, on the vertical axis, right? Um, and there's some extra work that the author decided to do. Um, uh, uh, again, this, this becomes very subjective. An example here could be the non, non, not applicable um, uh, variable could be something that I want to use in my data set. So I do not have to remove it. Uh, name so it, it heavily depends on how far you want to go and what your problem statement looks like um, for you to decide if there are any extra manipulation work that you want to do on the center set right so i'll flip through this for now because again like i said it's very subjective and heavily depends on what you want to do um uh, here uh let me go to the second question some question says if i go back here you can see that there's a release um uh, variable itself that is also displayed as a factor. And the question now says, what is the most common religion in this survey, right? Um, and if you run it, you realize that if I use that count function, like we explained earlier, we realize that Protestant is, um, uh, is the most common, right? And obviously the way they designed this code was uh, the count function you arrange in descending order so at least you can see the first one first then head the first one right um uh, so so you can see the very first one that is the most common right uh, so this is an interesting piece of code you probably use um so we can see here that protestant is the, is the most common then obviously the most common party id of those also is independent right so very very similar approach here uh count party ID, arrange in descending order, then view, view the first one, right? Uh, then again, you see the independence in the first one here. Right, so it's very straightforward. Um, the third question here is, uh, uh, what religion does denomination apply to? So let me go back to this. You can see that denomination is also another variable that is an instance itself. Then the question now becomes, what religion does denomination apply to? How can you find out with a table? And how can you find out with a visualization? So the first thing you can do here is to use the levels part here, right? So if I use levels and I call down using this dollar sign, the denom, right? I can see all the possible denominations that are on the, uh, that particular variable itself, right? Um, then they went into some extra details here. So they said, I think this is an interesting question. So I'll probably focus a bit more on this. So they said, for context, it's clear that denom refers to Protestant, and unsurprisingly, given that it is the largest category in the frequency. So if you filter out the non-response, right? Uh, so like, let's say, not applicable, no answer, and the others, right? To leave over denominations. After doing that, the only remaining response are Protestants, right? So you can do that if you run this particular code itself, right? Then you can obviously visualize if you want to go down that level, and you can see that what they're trying to say here is uh, the most frequent ends up being Protestant itself, right? Similar to how we did the count up here, right? Right, so, so let, me, let me go back to the book itself. I just wanted to do that quick detour for those to just appreciate a bit more data set itself. The interesting thing about this chapter is it's very, very straightforward, very, very self-explanatory. So the other parts around, um, um, the other parts around changing the order of levels and changing the values themselves are very, very satisfactory itself. And maybe two extra functions that we need to use um, uh, when we are using the factor, the factor function itself, right? So let's start with the first one, changing the order of the levels, right? Um, 
So I start off this way. So sometimes it could be useful to change the order of the, of the factor levels in the visualization. Uh, an example is, so they gave a use case here. If you decide you want to explore the average number of hours spent watching TV per day across religions. So let's go back to the data set itself, right? And you can see that there are a number of variables that are here. Example here is religion and the TV hours. So what we want to see here is the average number of TV hours per religion, right? Um, uh, right, and one quick way we could probably do that is before we get into reordering itself is we create this uh, religion uh, and we pass this through um, uh, ggcard data sets. We group by religion, then we summarize and you, so we, we do the mean age you remove every non-available value, right? Then you do the mean hours, which is our direct problem statement itself, the mean TV hours, then remove the non-available values. Uh, uh, then, then, you know, then you have N, then you do a GG plot, right? Of this region, the TV hours, now that you have defined it as the mean, as the X axis and your religion as your Y axis, then you do it in a geom point basis, right? Let me take a pause there. Another reason why I said this chapter is also very subjective is again, the, not, the non available um, values, or in this case, non values, um, could also be a useful data point for me. Or I could decide instead of, instead of completely excluding them, I want to replace them with, let's say, an average value, for example. So we don't necessarily have to use this. It obviously depends on what you are aiming for. And what your problem statement is here for this particular analysis it works for us to remove any any row that doesn't have an age for example or any row that doesn't have tv hours attached to it for example especially because we're creating a i could also decide that i want to replace that particular blank blank particular blank field with you know a different value itself right so i just want to take a step back here uh, so if we visualize this right now um, um this is kind of how we how we present itself. So, like we have designed this religion on y-axis, um, uh, um, the TV hours or the main TV hours itself on the x-axis, display uh, on a point basis. Uh, this is fine, but it's not yet clean, right? The other thing you can do here, which is now where modifying this factor that becomes important, is. I could decide I want to make this a bit more neater. I mean, I could, I could interpret this itself. It's just not quite appealing, right? So that's why they said it's difficult to interpret this plot because there's no overall pattern, right? Like I can't see the pattern from this entire plot itself, but I can improve this if I reorder the level itself of the religion variable using the FCT and FCT underscore reorder, right, uh, function. Right, so there, there are three arguments that it takes and we kind of see how that plays out itself. So let's go back to our ggplot and try to replay everything we did here using this FCT underscore reorder, right? So we start off the same way. We have our religion as the data sets, TV hours as our main X axis, or again, the main TV hours here. Then we now reorder this set itself. So what we're asking it is reorder this particular factor um, uh, based on this numeric variable right, that is our x-axis, right, and what we can see here is now there's a pattern to it, right, and I guess that's one of the beauties that um, Brioda brings in here. Um, as, we go, as, we, as we go into the chapter, you do realize that there are certain variables that uh, uh, it's probably best for you not to reorder it, and one of the ways they try to explain it in the book is, does the variables have a clear order itself or a very haphazard order? And that's for you now to make that judgment call if the order is already um, clearly expressed in the data set the way it is, or if you think it needs an, an extra reordering. And I think we'll see one of the problem statements there where a data set that already has its own order, and we now decide to order using you know, this entire function, obviously you know, distorts the entire information itself. Right? Um, so one of the things obviously that we can see here is the don't know category obviously watches a bit more TV and the Hinduism and other Eastern obviously watch a lot less TV. So it's a lot more easier to see this than to see it, than to see it in this particular. 
point. Um, then a quick step back here is, uh, again, I think one of the things I like the book for is to give you like best practices. Um, uh, so one of the things that they said here is, as you, once you start making very complicated transformations, um, it's probably best for you to move away from the basic GG plots the way it's designed. I'm moving to a mutate step, right? So a different way you could do this entire plot up here is literally run, create this itself. So that's very similar to this, right? Um, then you pass it through the mutate function, right? Religion, then you, then now you use FTT underscore reorder, right? Religion, you want you to, to reorder this religion itself based on this on the numerical values that it has on this main TV hours. Then you can now pass it through the GG plot itself, right? Um, and this is probably a cleaner way to do it once you start making a bit more complicated transformation work. So, right? Um, so yeah, this is the problem statement I was talking about. So they said, if you decide to do, if we decide to do a similar plot um, uh, with um, using average age varies, uh, if, we, if what if we, we create a similar plot looking at how average age varies across reported income levels, right? Uh, before I show you this piece of code itself, let me show you this. I think this is interesting part, right? So you notice that I decided to run this uh, uh, the way it is. Um, uh, and obviously I use my FCT reorder here. And if I, if, I, if I look at this, you can see that there's a pattern, obviously it's very easy for you to see that there's somewhat of a relationship between these two, these two variables, right? So the, the y-axis and the x-axis itself. However, if you look into the y-axis itself, you realize that, yeah, it's probably not as clean as you probably want it to be. And the reason why it's no longer clean is because we are forced to reordering work here, right? Um, and even if you can see a clear pattern um, and you can interpret this, this is probably not best practice itself, right? So what, what they ask you to do here is you make a judgment call if your variable is in a principled order. So that, that's where the subjective thought process comes in. Is my variable already aligned based on data set that I currently have or do I need to do a, a realignment, right? So what they are trying to express here is you reserve this FCT underscore reorder for factors that what they call it arbitrarily ordered or in my own words, for factors that are not well aligned the way you think your problem statement should be, right? Um, however, it does make sense. Um, I think I left a note here, let me see. Um, so like, like I wrote here, it, it makes sense above because of the scattered y-axis. Although the chart still shows somewhat of a co-direction between the, the, the variables. So like I said, the y-axis in the original plot, if you use the X, FCT underscore reorder, obviously made it because you can see a pattern. But if you look at the y-axis itself, you realize that it's become a bit more scattered, right? Um, so, so it said it, it, it does make sense to pull the not applicable to the front with the other special levels. Um, and we can use a different function called F60 underscore relevel, right? And what it does here is it takes that factor and then any number of variables that you want to move to the front of the line, right? So what you can now do is this, right? Uh, I now use ggplot, very similar idea of what we're doing so far, ggplot, my data set. Um, uh, now I have age as my X variable and my FCT level income itself. And I'm trying to push this forward itself. I'm trying to push this to a particular space. And you now notice that my not applicable now becomes last. And if you look at the Y axis itself, you see it kind of has a bit more direction to it. So from $1,000 all the way down to guys that do not refuse to answer the question or things like that. Um, I find this a very common question that is here. Um, so they said, why, why do you think the average age for not applicable is not so high? And this kind of made me think about my, my, my parents. <laughs> so if you think about it, the set is, um, uh, sorry for taking a step back, but I think, <laughs> I think it's one funny bit that I, I kind of saw. That set is a general social survey. So again, it includes everybody of all kind of ages itself, right? Uh, and I think one reason why I think that um, uh, you have, um, uh, let me go back here. One reason why I think you have not, yeah, like I wrote, 
I wrote here was, um, so if my parents were in this survey, for example, they are probably part of the individuals that would fill the survey. They either put the not applicable pit or they'll probably put not, non, non answer, right? And again, that's why I said it depends on the subject matter. So if you understand the asset itself, you realize that non applicable could actually be a useful asset for you to want to deep dive on instead of just excluding it itself from the entire data set, right? Another type of reordering um, is useful um, if you're coloring the lines on the plot itself. So, um, uh, so FCT underscore reorder two uh, reorders the factor by the Y values associated with the largest X values, right? So, so I mean, when we look at the plot itself, you'll probably see what that means. So before I go into the code itself, let me just try to explain what the entire graph is trying to show. All they are trying to do now is to now reorder this entire Y axis based on uh, like an ascending order of the X axis itself. Right. Um, so let me go back to the code. Right. So I create a new variable by age. I pass my data sets into this. Um, I filter so it's not available. Age. I group by age and marital. I do a count and I do a mutate. The extra bits of this mutate here create an extra column. And the column I'm trying to create here is, um, I think at this stage, it might be, might be interesting for us to see the data set itself. So let me just, just take a quick detour to my R Studio. Uh, so we can kind of see what that looks like, um, because I think it would be a bit more useful. Uh, just give me a minute, let me try to find it. Um, I think it's right here. I can't remember where I found it. So let, let me not take too much time, but let me just go back to the book. Uh, but the entire idea here is you're trying to create a new colon uh, that is now based on percentages, right? And when we get to the plot itself, I think we see how, how it does play out in town, right? So we run a ggplot. Um, again, we pass this as our, our now our data set. Uh, we have age as our x variable, and this prop now is now the y variable, right? Uh, it's now in percentages, color marital, and is now in the geom line itself. Or we could also run it this way, right? Where we see age as a data set, um, uh, by age as a data set, age as the X variable, prop as Y variable, then we try to do some extra work here, try, trying to color it. We wanted to color this marital um, and age and, and, and this entire reordering itself into a different color, right? And if I run it through a genome line, um, uh, then, then that's, that's how it plays out itself. But if I want to see it in, in, a bar, in a bar plot itself, right? What I do is I use FCT underscore in frequency, right? So all that levels an increasing frequency, right? And you know, simplest type of reordering because it doesn't need any extra variables and you can combine it with FCT, FCT underscore rev. So if I run this entire thing, this is how it looks like, right? Again, like I described, the entire work that we're trying to do here is to order this y variable itself in, 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 uh, in ascending order, right, of the x variable. So like what, what x variable contributes a lot more to the asset, then we can see that's how it plays out in the, on, the bar, on the bar plot, right? Um, so we have some exercises here. Um, I think what I'm going to do is let me finish up with this modifying the factor levels themselves. It's a very short bit, and I will just run the two exercises together. Right. So the, the other thing you can do to, to uh, a level is now modifying itself. Right. So modifying what is within the levels themselves. Right. Um, so more powerful here is um, um, more powerful than changing the other levels is changing the values that are within those levels themselves. Right. And this allows you to clarify the label for, for, for publication. And we'll see how that plays out. So when I get to the code, and collapses levels for a high level display, right? The most general and powerful is FCT on score record. And it allows you to record or change the value of each level, right? For example, let's, let's call out this explicit function itself. So we're calling out just one variable in this data set itself, so party ID. So if you look at it, it's a table, we can see the count itself. Um, uh, we can see that, uh, so party ID has a number of rows, right? The problem here is 
Um, they are not easily discernible. An example is, what's the difference between a strong Republican and a not strong Republican? I mean, yeah, I mean, it's useful, but it's not necessarily that intuitive itself, right? So as I said it here, the levels here are terse and inconsistent. So we want to try to tweak them to be longer and use a parallel construction, right? So what we are trying to do again is to fact level itself. What we're trying to do here is now for each of these uh, uh, rows that come under this, this party ID color, we're not trying to regroup it, right? Is it possible that we can maybe group one or two together? Um, and we'll see, we'll see what, when we get to like multiple grouping itself, this, this code itself is for singular groupings, right? So I have just one field that I'm trying to pass through uh, to group to a particular, let's say label that makes a bit more sense to me. Right, so strong Republican, what I called it here is a Republican, comma, strong, not strong Republican. I've changed that to Republican weak, independent, near Republican. I've changed that to independent, near Republican, independent, near Democrat. And I'm pretty much straightforward like that. This is a lot more useful for process for labels like this that are not strong Republican and not, not strong Democrat. At least now it is it's a bit more intuitive. So as a weak Democrat or a weak Republican, right. So now if we do a count, um, uh, you can see it's a bit more intuitive. So if you compare this, it's uh, this party ID and, and what, what we have now created is now a bit more intuitive, right? Uh, so you have no answers on four and the rest, right? Compared to what we had here, where the labels itself are not necessarily that intuitive for us to use. Um, uh, let me see if I missed anything out. Yeah, I, I think that's the major idea there. So, so what this FCT record helps you do is it will, it will leave levels that are not explicitly mentioned. Yeah, I think this is very useful. So it will, it will leave levels that are not explicitly mentioned as is and will warn you if you accidentally refer to levels that do not exist, right? Um, uh, and to group, to find groups. So this is what I meant by, if you now decide to do um, uh, a multiple count, classification itself. So an example here is, if I go back to this part that is not so intuitive, if I decide that I want to group, um, let's say a, a, a weak Republican and a weak Democrat together as a particular label, what I can now use is, let's get a minute. So to combine groups, you can assign multiple old levels to the same level itself, right? So we have the data set. Uh, then you can pass this through to a mutate function, party ID, FCT code that we just left out, but the labels are a bit more different, right? So now Republican, I think the most important thing here is now, um, uh, let me see if I've missed anything, uh, nothing yet. So, so now you have a strong Republican, it's now this, so Republican, strong Republican, weak, um, uh, independence, near, near Republican, I've now called them independent explicitly, a Republican, independent, near Democrats, pretty much the same thing, right? Then for these individuals that are here, no answer, don't know an other party. You can see them um, here. So an example is if we if if we have not done that multiple classifications themselves and we are using a single classification, right? They still show up explicitly here. But the idea here is I'm trying to collapse all this into others. Right, and I can also do the same thing, obviously, for for any of these classifications that are here, right? But now I've called label order, so now I have now made all these independent labels themselves. So no answer, don't know an order party, and I've collapsed it into a label that is called order. So now if I do a count, it makes it a bit more cleaner, right? So order is now five, four, eight, and everything else stays the same, right? Now, I guess another part here is like I, like I said at the beginning of this entire class itself is, again, deciding to go down this route heavily depends on what your problem statement looks like. If you decide that uh, it's good enough for your problem statement for you to classify all of this, because 508, for example, is quite a significant number for you to analyze as a group. Um, so it, it heavily depends on what you, what you aim to do, right? But this is just showing an idea of if you have particular fields or particular labels that you want to collapse into one, uh, this kind of is how you can do it if you use the FCT record function, right?
Um, and like you said here, yeah, you must use this technique with care. If you group together categories that are truly different, you obviously will end up with misleading results. So it heavily depends on uh, what you're looking for. Right? Um, so if you want to collapse a lot of levels, I think I left a note here. Um, so, the, so what I understood by this is, if you want to reduce the number of variables themselves, especially if they look alike, and again, your analysis or this, this, the outputs that you're aiming for allows you to collapse them, you could use FCT collapse, right? And it's a useful variant of this recode function. And, and what you can now do is for each new variable, you can provide a vector of code levels. So this is how it plays out. Very similar to what this looks like, um, to what this code function looks like, uh, but it's just a bit more different. So, so what I can now do is I have my data sets, I pass it through mutate, um, um, I have my colon, I have my FCT collapse, uh, then the colon I'm trying to collapse itself. And then now I have four labels, right? So I have order, under order I have put or no answer, don't know other party. Uh, under Republican, um, I have put strong Republican and not so strong Republican. Under independence, pretty much the same thing. Under Democrat, pretty much the same thing. Now, if I make a count, it's now a bit more cleaner, right? And, uh, and you know, sometimes you just want to lump together all the small groups to make a plot or the table a bit more smaller, right? Um, uh, and we can see that play out in this, in this region itself, right? An example of how we can see that play out is in this, in this colon, if I go to region um, variable, is I could decide I want to I want to lump these two together, right? So let's say I want to lump order a Republican together. Again, depending on what data sets we're trying to analyze, um, what you can do there is now with FCT lump, right? So pretty much the same idea. You pass your data sets through, um, you do a mutate function. Um, in this case, religion, uh, but in this case, it should have been party ID, right? You pass it through the FCT lump function region colon um, and then you do a count then obviously if you do this alone without the count it's to show you to show you this then if you do the count obviously to show this entire table itself but now you can see that i have now lumped everything to one so i have literally put everything I've collapsed everything into one so remember when we were looking through uh the protestant or the religion colon itself we see that i mean there were a number of religion and we decided to collapse everything apart from protestants into one that's why now we have just two fields on that religion, right? Um, so I think we're very close to the end. So, so we can you know, use the next two exercises. Um, so they said the default behavior here is to progressively lump together the smallest groups. I think it's quite important. Um, um, ensuring that the aggregate is still the smallest group. Um, in this case, it's not very helpful. It is true that majority of the Americans and the Soviet Protestants but we've probably over collapsed. I mean, definitely over collapsed because every other information that is here, if we decide to analyze this variable alone, has now been collapsed into order. And it doesn't give us the flexibility of understanding the independent behavior of each of, or each of the things that have collapsed here. So I guess the idea here is, you know, use this FCT lump sparingly, right? So it's not probably a go-to that you probably have to use as often as possible. And then I think the final bit here is instead we can use the n parameter to specify how many groups um, that we want to keep. I think it's very useful, right? So instead of lumping everything together, what we can now decide to do is so I pass my data set, I do my mutate, my, my religion variable. Now I have FCT lump, right? However, I'm just collapsing just 10, right? Uh, and, and this is how it now shows up. I think this is probably a better way to. Uh, to, to do this other than using like the full FC to lump itself. All right, so, so that brings us to the end of the chapter itself. I know I've quite I've said quite a bit, but again, like I said, the entire reason why I started I started with the thought process around Rango is the entire idea in this in this um at least in this part of heavily revolves around understanding where you are in your entire data work stream, right? So right now I am doing a lot more transformation and there's just a number of things that we have done and we have gone through. Uh, for the last maybe three or four weeks thereabouts, we've learned a number of things, right? And where we are right now is just a lot more of our categorical variables and forecasts or forecasts 
active as a package helps you solve um, for categorical variables. Um, so I'll probably pause there, give a minute. Um, they'll probably just run through the exercises themselves. If we have any questions, uh, why I just pull up. Just give a minute while I pull up the, the solution sheet. So just, just let me know if we have any questions or if we just deep dive into the solutions itself um, before we close. So I guess I guess we could go forward. Uh, so let's let's use let's just use solution book. All right. Uh, let me go to this part. Right. So modifying the factor levels itself again, like we said, uh, under these levels there are two major things you can do. You can modify the levels itself or change the actual actual values within the levels itself. So this exercise is a lot more about modifying the levels, right? Um, right, so let me just run through this. So the first question here says, how have the proportion of people identifying as Democrats, Republican, and Independent changed over time? Right, if you want to see that, we have to end up doing a graph. But before I explain this, let me just run through the code because I think it's quite interesting how they ended up getting here. So the first thing they decided to do was try to understand the levels themselves, right? So let, let's see what the levels kind of present itself before we kind of answer the question. Uh, uh, right now we have a number of guys that we, call others. Uh, so the no answer, the don't know, and the other party. Remember, we collapse them into no others, into other, other, other variable itself. Um, then how did we do that? So this now talks about collapsing into, like if you want to do a multiple classification itself, right? So in this particular, how this individual decided to um, answer this question, they decided to work with just four, four levels, right? So I go through this, my data sets, I do a mutate. Uh, the party ID, I collapse the party ID column itself into four different labels. So other Republican, Independent, and Democrat. I do a count. I group by year. I do a mutate to get a percentage. Then I do a ggplot, right? Um, then I use my color to be based on this factor reordering, right? Then I decide that my ggplot should be based on the line or a point, if you decide to be fancy. Uh, then my labels is uh, right? So what it shows here is, I mean, the question again says, how have the proportion of people identifying as Democrats, Republican, and Independent change over time? The first thing you probably see here is, Independent has always been the largest group itself, and obviously has been growing over time, especially the last year or so, right? That is when you go past 2010 itself, right? That's been growing. And others, or guys that identify as others, or that we collapsed as others, um, has been um, uh, the guys that, that don't make up the bunch of the entire um, party ID that are the variable itself, right? Um, again, here is where your subjectiveness comes into play. We could decide that we want to understand a bit more about these others and decide that we don't need to collapse this entire work here, right? So it depends on the problem statement itself, right? Uh, let me just do the second question, then I think we'll probably close because I think we are at time already. So the question now says, how could you collapse the reported income into a small set of categories? So again, when we went through the entire chat, we noticed that normal income reported income out here, right? Well, how could we collapse into categories? Again, this just goes into the idea of um, uh, um, uh, uh, how many labels do you want to create, right? So I uh, they decided to do a they decided to do some strings here, and I I, I guess it's useful when we get to this chart itself. Um, so they do they did library stringer, right? Your your data sets, you pass it through a mutate function, you collapse this, right, into two labels, or at least a number of labels here. So number one, you have unknown, uh, uh, and your unknown takes guys that are within the no answer, don't know, refuse, not applicable. Uh, then you have, let's say, less than 5,000. And these are guys that are, you know, within 1,000 and 4,000 and 999. Then you have guys that are between 5,000 and 10,000. So you can see how they kind of broke it out. Right? So this stringer function obviously allows you to do this part. Right? Then you can now do a plot right, of this, this ring cone that you just created. Right? Then if you do a bar plot and you do a chord flip like we learned earlier, uh, you can see that um, the display itself shows, the chord flip is what allows the display shows here. So 
Obviously, this is the x-axis where the code flip just flips the coordinate itself, shows on the y-axis, and just a bit more neater. So, okay. so the question says, how can you collapse this into small category of variables? In small categories, I think the way to answer this here is literally here itself. And this is how you can collapse it using the F FCT collapse function. Right. Um, uh, let me see if there's any other one that we could do. Uh, yeah, I think we'll probably post there. So we probably don't go over the hour. Um, so next week, I'll also be taking um, time, um, dates and times. Um, I'll, I'll we start next week itself doing this exercise itself for modifying the factor levels. Then we'll just go into, into dates and times. Um, that's, that's all I have for you guys today. Thank you very much. That was great. Thank you, Daniel. That was really informative. Fantastic. I like the way you presented it too, going in between the different screens. That was that was a good way to do it. I mean, I, I was really worried it was going to be quite absurd at the end. Um, yeah. Because that's kind of how I, I read through this chapter. There's quite a number of things that we have to juggle at the same time. But thank you very I much. Think, I think that's a good way to do it because I know when I was doing strings and it took three weeks to do, it was uh, those exercises take a lot of time walking through each one. Yeah. And it's kind of mm -hmm. like, you're right. It's it's a, you got you kind of got to jump around the way that it makes more sense to kind of skip over it and then come mm -hmm. back to it at the end. I think that was a really yep. good way to do that. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sean. Um, all the best, guys. Have a very good rest of your week. Cheers.